So um, I know Brenda Yanis is on. She is the field deputy for assembly member um, Luz Rivas. Um, Brenda, I don't see you, but I know you're here someplace. I'm Luz here, Lori. Luz okay, there you are. Hi, Brenda. So Hi, you, nice want to, to see you, Lori. you want to introduce nice yourself to a little bit? Yeah, introduce yourself a little bit and then go ahead and introduce the assembly member. Is she on already? Yes, yes she okay. is. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you, Lori, you for, see. yeah, thank you so much for inviting us first and foremost and happy new years to everyone. And like Lori mentioned, my name is Brenda Yanez. I am one of the field representatives for Assemblywoman Luz Rivas. Now, I represent several communities for the assembly Assemblywoman, including Somar, Mission Hills, Pacoima, Sun Valley, and Lakeview Terrace. So if any of you have any questions, you can always feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll be putting my information in the chat box and I'll be more than happy to connect with any of you. And let me go ahead and introduce the Assemblywoman now. Um, Assemblywoman uh, Luz Rivas, feel free to um, hop on and provide some remarks now. See You're on. muted. Sorry, I was all ready to go, and I'm like, Yeah, there you are. You should know these this whole thing. You know, by this heart, is my right? whole day. I do this eight hours <laughs> of the day, right? I'm on Zooms all day, but ha so excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to Lori. I was just telling Brenda, I was texting her, everybody I know on this call. FYI, I know Sochi. I went to high school with her. I know Anita. I know Vanessa. Of course, Olivia. Mr. and Mrs. Ressa, of course. You know, so I was just like telling her, I know all these people, so be good to them, right? <laughs> but thank you for inviting me here. You know, I'm in Sacramento right now. Um, very excited that now we have this technology. Now we're using this technology um, because even though I'm away, I can still be here and join you tonight. Uh, I am, um, you know, I'm working on. Um, in case you don't know me, I represent the Assembly District 39, um, which includes communities from Silmar all the way down to North Hollywood, uh, you know, Sun Valley, Pacoima, uh, you know, Lakeview Terrace, Salantahunga, all these communities. I grew up in my district. I'm from Pacoima and Arlita. I went to graduated from San Fernando High School, and my government teacher is on this call, Mr. Ressa. Um, and, uh, you know, very proud to represent my community in the state assembly. I was elected in June of 2018. Um, so I've now been in the legislature for two and a half years. Um, I'm currently the chair of natural resources committee, um, which is a really big committee. I'm very excited to be on this committee. Um, the jurisdiction that this committee has are, are issues like climate change, CEQA, forestry, um, lots of environmental issues. And I think it's important as a Latina a, that comes from a community, like an environmental justice community, to be represented on a committee like this, especially in California. California leads in these, in these fields and in the, in these issues. And whatever California does, eventually the whole country does. So very excited to be in this position. Um, I want to talk a little bit about covid and vaccinations, because I know that's what a lot of us are thinking. You know, my district has some of the highest COVID rates in LA County. Um, you know, we are, unfortunately, we are like the epicenter of the epicenter in, in, in the state. And so I've been busy up here in Sacramento advocating for um, a focus, more vaccinations in our community, because we, are being affected more. Like in my district, uh, there's been over 80,000 cases of COVID and over 1,100 deaths just in the 39th Assembly District. And, you know, there's parts of the state that don't even, there's counties that don't even come close to that. And as you know, we're just a little tiny piece of LA County in, in the 39th Assembly District. So I've been pushing and advocating um, to make sure that our seniors and others that are more vulnerable get that have more access to vaccinations because right now the mega sites are at Cal State Northridge and in Encino, but you know a lot of people can't get to Encino or Cal or CSUN. 
um, even though it's in the valley, um, you know, not everybody has the transportation and someone to take them there. But if they're able to get vaccinated at the clinics that they attend, that they go for, for medical services, like for example, um, Northeast Valley Health Corporation, uh, then you know that a clinic like that that serves the most vulnerable in our community can reach out to its patients and and get them in. And so finally, they're going to start allowing um, what they call the federally qualified health centers, like Northeast Valley Health Corporation, to start vaccinating. Um, and last month, what happened? Governor Newsom announced that he plans to contract with Blue Shield of California to be the third party administrator for vaccinations. And I was a bit, I was very concerned and I still have some concerns about that. And I've been meeting weekly with the administration uh, to discuss these because my concern with having um, an entity like Blue Shield, uh, you know, be in charge of, you know, vaccination distribution is that, you know, they're, they mainly work with people that are insured. And, and so I'm thinking of the uninsured and, and they're, and what incentive is, is in there for them to actually start off in low income communities that are hard hit by COVID. And so those are the questions that I've presented to the governor's administration, because there are, they, they say that there are some incentives in there, like financial incentives in the contract that Blue Shield would make more money, you know, by uh, vaccinating communities like ours. But what if it's not enough and a place like Blue Shield says, you know, this isn't worth it. We have to do a lot more outreach, a lot more work to vaccinate this community um, that's hard hit while we can go to a mass site in a, a different type of community and, and focus on numbers and speed, right? Get as many people in there that have access to the internet that can sign up for appointments and have no issue in getting there. And so that's what I'm looking forward to reading more of the details of this contract. Um, it's scheduled for February 15th, so next week. Um, they're supposed to unveil um, the details of this. Um, but the, the governor really thinks that this is the way to go, that this would speed up and also um, you know, you know, reach communities that are hard hit like ours. And so that's what I've been focused on here. Um, you know, the state is trying to create a system that is consistent across the state because what we've been doing hasn't necessarily been working. Um, you know, it's worked for some, but not for all and not for the most vulnerable. And, and so they're trying to transition to a system where there's, you know, one entity administering and making decisions on how to distribute vaccines more effectively and, and equitably. Um, and, but also to have a statewide system that you can go to, to sign up for a vaccine. And so that's where we are in the state right now. Um, it's, and there's still more updates to come and more details um, for us to learn about and see. And, you know, the legislature, you know, at least my colleagues in the assembly, every week we're asking questions, we're meeting with the, the governor's administration and other leaders. I have a meeting tomorrow with Blue Shield of California to ask questions um, on their plan to vaccinate low-income communities. And so I'm, I'm happy to update you and send you an update on what they've, they've let us know. Um, and so besides COVID and you know COVID vaccines, I've also been focused on introducing legislation you know, we just started our legislative session in January um, and I've begun to introduce bills. Um, my focus this year continues to be on homelessness, homeless students. Um, you know, I have a bill that will uh, create a, a youth commission for the state where youth could participate um, and give their input into policy and other issue areas. 
Um, I have a school lunch bill that we're announcing tomorrow. Um, it's sponsored by the American Diabetes Association. Uh, and so I'm just, I'm focused on issues that affect our communities and where there could potentially be a policy solution. And so that's, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and stop there because I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and what you want to know in terms of what's going on in, in your state government. Okay, so everybody open up and ask your questions. Well, I, have a, I have a question, uh, Rosemary Muniz. Um, I live in the LA area, in Highland Park area. And a student, a, a person asked me about, I said, have you taken your, your COVID shot? He goes, no, I'm on document. <laughs> I can't take it. I, I said, yes, you can. So is there, because they have to show ID. What happens if they don't have IDs? Mm -hmm. So how, yeah. do, how do we go? The vaccine is free of charge and is, a, and will, and is available to everyone. Right. There's a lot of misconceptions that you have to pay, um, that you have to, you don't have to have health insurance. Um, you, you don't, like you said, you can be undocumented and there's no charge at all. Everybody, you just, for now, you have to qualify, right? Right now it's, um, by age, right? And so right now I, I haven't received the vaccine because I don't qualify yet. Um, and, um, but it is open to all. But they ask for ID when you're signing up. Mm -hmm. when you, oh, if someone doesn't they, have ID, is that yeah, your question? Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, good question. He has no form of ID, like even foreign from another country. That will. I do not. So it's okay. So right, because some if if you know, I know some areas, and and we can check for you and and get back to you if you'd like, um, okay. in terms of what type of ID is accepted. Right. right. Uh, yeah. and, and I think it depends on the county and we can ask the county. Um, mm -hmm. But one of my colleagues is from San Diego. Um, she represents the border, you know, the U.S. border. And, and so they made a list of what types of IDs okay. are accepted mm -hmm. to get the, you know, to prove that it's you. Right. I think it's not really checking in terms of your doc, whether you're undocumented or not. It's just, they just want to make sure that you signed up with your information and it's you that's actually, you know, getting the vaccine. Right, right. So any so, type of ID should be okay then. If whatever we will, is we will, what we'll do, and I'm, I'm looking at Brenda, if she does it, um, she'll, she'll take notes um, and we will, we can contact the county and get back to you. Okay. Just to make sure, but that's a great question. Thank okay. you. Liz, this is, this is Maria Reza. What about the supply of vaccines? How is that coming along? Yeah, that's the challenge. And that's what we hear from the people within the governor's administration that are working on this is that they're, you know, they're limited by the supply. They're hoping to get more from the federal government, you know, and, and they're relying on that. And with the transition in administration, uh, they feel confident that soon there'll be more vaccines coming in that they're then they're able to distribute. Um, but it, it is a challenge. My push has been that we should be focused on the hot spots of the state, these communities that are like, like Pacoima. I don't know if you read, there was a New York Times article on Pacoima um, and how, uh, how many people are affected by COVID in, in, in Pacoima and you know, we should set a criteria and then distribute more to these communities than other parts of the state. And my not, not all my colleagues agree, right? Because that means then their counties in Northern California or in other parts will get less. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the fight we have up here. <laughs> I mean, some people think it should be distributed evenly. And I'm like, well, COVID has not been um, you know, the, the amount of people that have gotten COVID has not been even, right? If we were to do like a map of the state with like how many people have COVID, it's not even, right? So I just don't understand why we can't do that. So, Luce, I have a, a comment. Sure. Uh, 
I don't know how many of you saw Gustavo Arellano's uh, editorial column in the Times about a week ago, and he talked about his father not wanting to get vaccinated and all of the reasons why he didn't want to get vaccinated. So in my mind, it yes, we need to have those vaccines in those communities, absolutely. But there also needs to be a big educational push yes. to educate people about why it's okay to take this vaccine and why you know, being a good person isn't enough to protect you from getting COVID. Yes. So there are some efforts and not enough yet for, for the size of our state and our communities. Uh, but uh, I know LA County has begun working with community-based organizations. Um, and I know, I think Pacoima Beautiful is working and just getting started where they're able to do outreach um, to their members or you know whoever um, they serve the community the community based organizations um, and just kind of like educating them on the vaccine right and uh, and so I think we could be doing more on that and and you know I know the Latino caucus I'm a member of the Latino caucus which is all of the Latino members in the legislature we've been pushing when we have meetings on you know we need like a a Latino focused plan that includes that outreach, right? And, uh, and that will target our communities. Um, but there are some, but not enough out there. Uh, I know my, like my mom watches Univision all day, right? And she keeps telling me that someone got sick about, you know, someone, to, she was scared to get the vaccine, but we finally got her an appointment. You know, she's 77. And I took her and I'm like, you're just gonna do it. I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And then she she already had some friends that did it. So then it was word of mouth that they were okay. Um, you know, and she'll get her second dose at the end of the month. But a lot of people are nervous and about getting the vaccine, but I think it's worse to get COVID. And mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we definitely, you know, there are some side effects in some people. Um, very minimal that, you know, what I've heard. Uh, but, you know, once after a few days, then they're probably okay. I think this is a good place to uh, promote the promotoras. You know, the promotoras yeah. is a mm -hmm. community outreach, mm -hmm. you know, for Absolutely. care, for nutrition, for, you know, this would be a very good place for the use of promotoras in our community. You're right. That's a good idea. Hi, Assembly Luz three of us. It's Michelle Rogel, Rogel from Pacoima. Oh. And I just wanted to um, see if there's any way, um, you know, with your leadership and, you know, Brenda as well, if, you know, like at this point, there's a lot of people in our community that, you know, just aren't tech savvy in general, right? Um, and I know in the past, just with the COVID, um, signups online i remember you had to put an email and then they changed it where you could do a text alert you know for an appointment mm -hmm. and so a lot of you know a lot of the families here in our community are being left out and then now with the, the vaccine um when i went to the balboa park today in i think i was in encino i, I didn't really see you know much diversity at all i got mm -hmm. my second dosage today and um you know they looked at my id and then the, the volunteer, the person didn't know, they, they didn't know where Pacoima was at. I explained it to them and wow. I said, no, wow. I'm like, I'm local. And I explained it, but you know, I didn't see anybody. Um, I, I just didn't see diversity. Like when I was there and even when people were waiting 15, 30 minutes, yeah. I, I didn't see any Latinos. And you're you know, right. I, I went, that's where I took my mom for her vaccine to Bubble Park. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just me. my nephew came with us. So I think we were the only three Latinos in line. I mean, <laughs> they, and, just, and so I, I was thinking it would be like, you know, if we could do like some sort of like initiative or a workshop at this point and see if there's volunteers or anybody or even the county that can go to the parks, you know, here in San Fernando Valley, rotate it and even outside food for less, the grocery stores, because everyone has to get food. And, and just start doing some sort of outreach, you know, and, and push it because, you know, there's so many people are getting left out. 
and I got it because of my work, but there's a lot of seniors that I've been seeing that no one has gotten it, unfortunately. Yeah, we've been, you know, my office has helped people um, get vaccination, you know, sign up, you know, and, and give information, um, you know, but we definitely need a bigger effort, right? And um, according to the governor's administration, when Blue Shield takes over, um, that they will have outreach plans to serve. If they have a site, a vaccination site, well, one is they need a bigger vaccination site in our community. But my some of our questions and what um, I've been pushing is like, you know, some any someone from anywhere in LA County can sign up and come to San Fernando and take up all the appointments. You know, only because a vaccination site is located in Silmar or Poima, it doesn't mean that it's going to be, how do we know? What are we going to do to assure that it's actually serving that community? Because there's a lot of people across the county that are willing to drive anywhere and, and they'll spend all day in line. When I went to Bubble Park, there was another line of people that in case they have extra vaccine, you know, there was, it was like the non-appointment line. And in, if they have extra vaccine, at the end of the day, then they'll just vaccinate. And anyone, it didn't matter how old you were, if you had any pre-existing conditions, or you know your, you know your uh, vocation. If you were even a health worker, you could just get in that line. And and some people are willing to just get in that line all day and just to get the vaccine. Or they were calling them vaccine crashers, right? Like there was an LA Times article about this, um, and. You know, not everyone in our communities can do that. You know, people work or they don't have someone that can take the half of the day off to go take them. And like, I'm lucky that I could take my mom to go get her vaccine, but my sister works all day. She doesn't have a flexible job uh, like I do, even though I'm super busy, but I could say no to something and just cancel, right? And just go, which is what I did that day. I canceled all my appointments after a certain hour so that I could make sure that my mom went. But not everybody has a kid that can do that, right? And uh, and so I've been focused. And what the administration has responded is that Blue Shield, when they take over the administration, will have a plan in place to make sure that people signing up for appointments in certain communities are from that area right and so i haven't seen the plan or how they're going to do it but that's what they're telling us right now as it's being developed so i'm just letting you know the responses that i'm getting from the administration when i ask these questions so Luce, i have a question um, in regards to the schools opening specifically LA Unified. I've been told they're going to be opening in a couple of months, maybe not to the end of June. What's your feeling and what, what do you think so is going to happen? Heard, um, right now, there's negotiations between um, the legislature and the governor on a school reopening plan. Um, we weren't too happy with the plan that he announced in December. Um, he had a plan, the governor, he didn't consult with with districts like LA Unified, which is the largest school district. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my issue. You know, they didn't share the plan with them and tell them, is it feasible? What do you think? Um, they just announced it like on December 30th, mm -hmm. right? Surprised everybody. Um, and unfortunately didn't include everybody that's affected, you know? And so now a new plan is being negotiated and it, the governor said that it will be announced on Friday. Um, it, it should have already been announced this week, but I, we just haven't agreed on, on the same things, you know, and, and it's the Senate, the assembly and the governor that are negotiating right now. And it, it's very close um, and uh, it's focused, what I've heard it's focused on TK through sixth grade. The younger kids are first uh, because they, you know, there's been studies that younger kids don't spread COVID as much as older kids. Um, and, and so that's been the focus on the TK through six grades. Um, but I don't know how it's going to look yet because it should be Friday. 
from what I heard. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Um, yeah. And I'm a teacher and um, I have had I've heard so many mixed um, information about teachers that they're okay to go without vaccines, but at the same time our union, no, I I disagree. Teacher in Los Angeles or like LA? here in the valley. Yeah, LA. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so much. Yeah, like your union or the teachers' union are saying teachers should be vaccinated before they go back, right? I personally agree. I mean, I'm not a teacher and I haven't talked to all of the teachers, um, I, but if we're asking them to go back, um, I feel that they should be protected. They're essential workers, right? They're, um, and we're putting them at risk, right? But there has been some studies that show that the younger kids, that it, 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 it is safe with having teachers teach the younger kids, the elementary school age kids. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just giving you my personal opinion. Right. I'm not a teacher, but if I were a teacher, I wouldn't want to go back without being vaccinated or, or making sure that there are strict guidelines. But, exactly. but I, I mean, I've worked with little kids. I mean, even if you have strict guidelines, they're not always followed, right? They're kids, right? They don't, mm -hmm. you know, they'll keep off their mask and, you know, do exactly. lots of in the classroom. Yeah. That's, that's just my personal opinion, not based on any research or anything. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of teachers here on this call. Um, yeah. The they have a lot of teachers here as members. So um, we have we have a couple of minutes left. And um, I know Laura Casas had a question for you, Laura. You uh, yes, assem Assembly, Assemblywoman uh, Rivas. I would like to add, thank you for all the work you're doing on the vaccines and, and lending your voice to the underserved in, in the community. But I also want to hear what your opinion is. I know you're working on the issue of homelessness. And I know students have uh, food insecurity and homelessness. And what is your opinion on, on, there was a bill on using community college parking lots for housing, like parking lots, so right, students yeah. could park their kids. And I just want to know, curious how you feel about that bill and what solutions might you have? Um, so yeah, my colleague, assembly member Mark Berman introduced that bill, I think it was two years ago or last year. Yes. Two years ago, right? Um, he had a lot of opposition from the community colleges uh, yes. because they felt, and they came to, I had people from Mission College come to me um, to, to express their concerns. Um, you know, it's not that they don't want to provide a place for their students. It was more about the costs and the infrastructure that they need, right? Maybe security and bathrooms and um, and so that's where they were worried, that they were worried. Um, I think we need to start focusing with community colleges on housing for students and um, providing more financial aid to them, right? And, and, and so that, like, like, like we do with our Cal States and our UCs, right? Because they have the same expenses and living expenses as a, a, a a student in a four-year college, right? Um, but I wasn't against the bill, um, against that bill at all. Uh, but I did hear a lot from the community colleges. And um, in my district, I have um, LA Mission Colleges in my district. And they did come to me and express their concerns about that bill. So I, I guess your your solution would be to increase like uh, the Cal grant or or uh, funding outside of to uh, to complete the total cost of education, not just yeah, tuition. which are their expenses. Um, one of my colleagues, I think it's Connie Leva, Senator Connie Leva, had a bill that would have done that for community college students to include the expenses as part of their financial aid. Um, I, I don't think it made it or I'm not sure because of last year because of COVID, but um, there have been efforts here to do that. Well, thank you. Thank you for your work on that. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, no, I was going to say oh. that I have the flyer if she wants to uh, me to share the oh. flyer. 
the oh, flyer yes, on the yes, yes, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah. The we, governor's we, appointments we, workshop. <laughs> yeah. Before you we, forget. we wanted to post it for everybody. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. I was making sure that we did this. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm hosting a workshop um, on March 5th um, with um, the governor's appointment secretary. You know, she's Latina, Catherine Rivera Hernandez. Um, and she's, her role is to find people, the right people to, to be appointed to boards and commissions um, and other, other positions throughout the state that the governor appoints um, people to, right? Um, they look for all different types of people based on expertise, where you're from, who you are, um, depending on the board or the commission or the committee that's available. Um, and that's her full-time job is to look for people. There's a process. Um, and so I had a meeting with her and I asked her, would you be willing to explain this whole process to my community? Because I don't think a lot of people in our area even apply or know that, you know, they can be eligible for an appointment. Uh, and so she's going to uh, be the guest and, and explain to us what the process is and what it takes. Um, and so I encourage as many, you know, if you know someone that's interested um, in serving in, in state government, you know, please share this with them. I, I invite all of you to join. I just really feel that our community is underrepresented in a lot of different areas. And one of my goals is to change that, to get more people appointed to commissions, you know, and for me, it's the state because that's, I'm your state legislator. And so that's my goal and we finally have it set up. And so um, if you have any questions, you can ask Brenda about it. Oh, I, I'm looking at Michelle, is there an age requirement? Um, not that I know of, it did not, not for this workshop. Um, there's a lot of appointments and I, I mean, I don't think we discriminate by age, right? You know, um, I, they're, um, but, and, Probably not like a ten-year-old, right, or a, or a, you know, a teenager. Uh, but you know, any adult. We have students that are on commissions. You know, it just depends on each commission. Um, but Catherine will be able to explain a lot more. And so, even if you're not interested, but if you attend and you work with students or with, uh, you know, different types of, I don't know, whoever, women or. Um, that you could re help recruit people to this. Great. Thank you, Luz. Okay, what we'll do is we'll send it out to all our members and then ask them to please send out to those who might be interested as well. So yeah. we Everyone will do helps. our best to get out. Perfect. No requirement Perfect. To, to listen and ask questions at this workshop. So. Well, we just want to thank you for spending the time with us tonight. Thank you for um, all that you do. It's been great having you as our representative. Are you in for one more term or how, many, how much longer are you in office? Well, um, it'll be six I'll, years. As long as you have me, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, you've been elected every two years. Yes. And I just got reelected this November, um, but I term out in 2030. Oh, oh wow. Okay. So we'll have you in office for a while. Perfect. Perfect. I hope so, right? Yeah. Well, you've, it, it's been great. Yeah. You've been a great representative and Brenda's awesome to work with. She's so responsive and she's been a friend to Comision and she even attended one of our events uh, a couple of years ago. So that's how we got to get to know her. So we yeah. love having, we love our relationship with her and, and her support of Comision and of course your support. So Thank you so much, Assembly Member. We look forward to continue seeing you on FaceTime, thank, or on, on Facebook, not FaceTime, um, and then hopefully. I, I also want to offer, you know, my office, my district office is in Arlita on Laurel Canyon, mm -hmm. um, close to Branford. Um, if you or anyone you know has an issue with the DMV, um, EDD, unfortunately, every, lots of people that mm -hmm. are unemployed are having issues with EDD, my office can help. And, and okay. you can call us, or if your neighbor is having some issue, just call us. We will. <laughs> I know Brenda, <laughs> we'll call you. Oh. I know Brenda posted, <laughs> Brenda posted her contact information. So please everybody okay. write down her contact. 
information. <laughs> we'll also send it out to everybody so everybody will have it. So you'll hear from us often, Brenda. Thank you. Okay. Um, so nice thank you. you. Thank you so much, Bye. Assembly Member. Thank you for Bye. all your hard work and representing sure. us. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Okay, everybody, I think that's about it.